On behalf of Plur Publishing, my co-editors, Professor Tucker Woodson and Dr. Brian Rotenberg, we'd like to thank you for buying our book. I'm Dr. Kenny Pang. I'm the chief editor of this book. We all know that obstructive sleep apnea over the many years has increased in prevalence and incidence. And we all know that this is attributed partly because of the increase in the incidence of obesity, but we also know that because of the increase in awareness, the diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea has increased. It is very nice and idealistic to say that in order to increase the space or the airspace within the box itself, one can either decrease the amount of soft tissues, as in to remove tonsils, to shrink the tongue base, to hold it forward, or to stiffen the lateral pharyngeal walls. All these would help obstructive sleep apnea, or even to increase the craniofacial skeleton by increasing the box. However, we all know that the pathophysiology of obstructive sleep apnea is more than just the container and its contents. Airway evaluation has become more and more important and crucial in evaluation of obstructive sleep apnea. We all know that the awake state of the airway versus the sleep state of the airway is completely different. This is attributed to the muscle relaxation mechanisms, the feedback mechanisms and the neurophysiology behind obstructive sleep apnea itself. Hence, the evaluation of airway and the awake state is very, very crucial, especially during the sleep state. And this can be achieved with drug-induced sleep endoscopies. Drug-induced sleep endoscopies have become more and more important in the field of obstructive sleep apnea. You can do it in any way you want, but please remember that patient's safety comes first. Diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea is not just in airway evaluation, but in different modalities of sleep diagnosis. And this has evolved over the years from a cumbersome hospital-based level 1 polysomnogram to a portable home monitoring system or device like the peripheral arterial tonometry technology. This really depends on the available technology that you have in your country and depends on the state-of-the-art facilities you have in your hospital. Treatment of obstructive sleep apnea still falls back on what we call the Continuous Positive Airway Pressure Machine or the CPAP, CPAP device. We all know that this works efficiently, but is it efficacious? If you prescribe a CPAP machine to a patient, if he puts it on his face and if he uses it for 6 hours per night, 7 days a week, it is absolutely efficacious. But unfortunately, we know that it's in a laboratory condition and that is definitely idealistic to believe that every patient will wear it for seven hours a night, or six hours a night, seven days a week. Surgical treatment of obstructive sleep apnea has moved from ablative surgery. We used to call it the uvulectomy or the UPPP, uvulopalatopharyngoplasty, to more reconstructive surgeries. Reconstructive surgeries are the way to go in obstructive sleep apnea surgical treatment. We all know that uvulectomy does not equate sleep apnea surgery. In more ways than one, it has failed in the cure or treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. Current new techniques have been evolved, including the expansion pharyngoplasty, lateral pharyngoplasty, trans-advancement pharyngoplasty, Z-plasty, and of course, every other method that has been described. All these methods have shown to be efficacious in their own way, targeting the anatomical site that is obstructing in a patient with obstructive sleep apnea. One mustn't forget the pathophysiology of the nose in the entire armamentarium of obstructive sleep apnea. We all know that in order for us to breathe air from the nose, into the lungs, one must create a negative pressure in the intrapleural space. If you create a negative pressure in the intrapleural space to suck in air from the atmosphere, it will have to pass through the nasal cavities 
the retropalatal space behind the palate as well as behind the tongue. Hypothetically, if there was any obstruction in the nose, for example, enlarged inferior turbinates, septal deviation or nasal polyps, one would have to create a bigger negative pressure in order to suck in air from the atmosphere into the lungs. Can you imagine that creates a bigger negative pressure in the hypopharyngeal region, results in collapse of the hypopharyngeal space or behind the tongue or even behind the palate. Hence, we know that it's crucial to treat the nose as part of the surgical management of obstructive sleep apnea. We know that the nose treatment is pivotal in treatment of obstructive sleep apnea. It is not primary. That means to say that treating the nose alone in obstructive sleep apnea is up to 1-5%, 15% successful. And therefore, it's prudent to treat a patient surgically with obstructive sleep apnea to not only treat the palate, but the nose as well. Not forgetting the tongue. We know that there are multiple techniques that have been introduced for treatment of retrolingual collapse or tongue-based obstruction, from reduction to nerve stimulation to little strings that pull the tongue forward. All these have to be considered in a patient with obstructive sleep apnea. We all know in surgical treatment of obstructive sleep apnea, it is not the surgery that is involved. It's the complete care of the patient from pre-operative assessment, perioperative assessment and post-operative assessment. We all know that obstructive sleep apnea patients are special from their sensitivity to narcotics, to their shared airway with the anesthesiologist during the operation, to the post-operative care due to airway compromise and oxygen desaturations. We are aware that it is very important to look after this patient as a whole, from nutrition, obesity, hypertension to cardiovascular disease. As you go through the surgical DVD with the various surgical techniques available in obstructive sleep apnea, it might be prudent to select your patients carefully based on the indications and criteria that's laid out in the book itself. Doing surgery for obstructive sleep apnea, you may learn from a DVD, but it would be better to attend whatever courses that's available in your country or in the region. The International Sleep Surgical Society is actively organising sleep surgery courses with cadaveric dissection around the region and around the world. Please try to attend these courses and take home at least one new surgical procedure that you can do from each course. That will be beneficial not just to yourself, but to the patients that you treat. Thank you very much.